The aggregate stock market, for example, its price to earnings ratio has historically been very volatile. So this is a plot of the stock market's price to earnings ratio over the past century. Uh, specifically, it's a ratio of the price to the average of the previous 10 years earnings. And you can see big fluctuations in this ratio over time, right? Sometimes the price to earnings ratio is quite low, like four, sometimes as high as 40 or so. And so there's a very basic and fundamental question, which is why does the stock market fluctuate so much and how should we respond to its fluctuations? The aggregate US stock market, for example, its price to dividend or price earnings ratio has historically been very volatile. And I want to try to understand why it's been so volatile. And that turns out actually to be a major challenge. All right, so let me lay out some thoughts about this. What I want to do is I want to start by thinking if we were trying to explain stock market volatility from the rational perspective, what could we then say? In other words, I want to start by thinking about how would we explain stock market volatility in an economy where everyone is fully rational? All right, so here's how to structure this. In an economy where everyone is fully rational and there are no frictions, the price of the aggregate stock market is going to be given by this expression, which you should recognize as the present value formula. It says that the value of the stock market will be its expected future cash flows, in this case dividends, forecasted as carefully as possible using all available information and then discounted at a sensible discount rate. And we think that this sensible discount rate has two components, a riskless rate, which is compensation for the time value of money, and I'm often going to write it RF for risk free, plus a risk premium, which is compensation for risk. And we think of that as being made up of two components. It's the amount of risk that you are forecasting, again, as carefully as possible using all available information, multiplied by the price of risk, which is the compensation you demand per unit of risk. And that depends on investor risk aversion. All it's really saying is, if I expect companies to be very profitable in the future, that's the numerator, then the stock market should have a high value today. If I expect high interest rates, RF, in the future, then the stock market should have a low value, right? Because there's a competing asset that is attractive. If I expect high risk in the future, then the stock market should have a low value because I don't like risk. And if I'm very risk averse, then the stock market should have a low value because, again, if I'm very risk averse, I don't like risk. And so this formula, I think, gives us a very sort of nice systematic way of thinking about why would the stock market go up and down in a fully rational economy. And by staring at the right hand side, you can see that in a fully rational economy, there are four possible reasons for the stock market to go up or down. First of all, there could be changes in the numerator. In other words, we could get new information that tells us that companies are going to be more profitable in the future, and that will push the stock market market up. Second channel, the risk-free rate. We might get information telling us that the risk-free rate is going to be higher in the future. That will push the stock market down because there is this competing asset that we now know is going to be more attractive. Third channel, risk. If I get new information telling me that the stock market is going to be riskier in the future, that will push the stock market down because I don't like risk. And fourth channel, risk aversion. If people become more risk averse, that will push the stock market down. So four channels, four reasons why the stock market might fluctuate in a fully rational economy. And then in 1981, Bob Schiller wrote a classic paper where he showed that this just could not be the case. In other words, it could not be that stock market fluctuations were driven by rationally changing forecasts of future cash flows. And this was an immensely influential paper that really changed the way we think about the stock market, and it led directly to his Nobel Prize many years later. So I just want to run you through Bob Schiller's argument now. It's both sort of simple and profound at the same time. So this is, this is how it goes. Let's go back to this picture here. So uh, understand what the channel is here, what the story is here. The story is the reason prices are high here, here, 
here and here is because at those moments, people were rationally forecasting higher earnings on companies over the next few years. So rationally forecasting higher earnings here, 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 and here. But Bob Schiller pointed out, if those forecasts are actually rational, we should see higher earnings in the next few years. So what Bob Schiller is really saying is, this channel is making a very key prediction, which I've outlined over here on the board. It's saying, suppose we do a graph where you have the price to earnings ratio in any year on the horizontal axis and subsequent earnings growth on the vertical axis, and each dot here is a year over the past century, then we should get an upward sloping line. And this is what you get. And this is one of the most remarkable and I think important graphs in finance. Each number here that you see in the picture is a year over the past century. The horizontal axis is the price to earnings ratio. The vertical axis is subsequent earnings growth over the next 10 years. This line is not upward sloping. It's flat. After years with high price earnings ratios, you don't see higher earnings growth. After years with lower price earnings ratios, you don't see lower earnings growth. So this is a complete rejection of this first channel. It's a rejection of the idea that stock market fluctuations are driven by rational forecasts of future cash flows. I should say more broadly that this study of Schiller's really shocked the academic profession because it showed that the framework people had been using for decades to think about stock market fluctuations was simply wrong. This paper is also viewed, I think I mentioned before, as the origin of behavioral finance because by showing that stock market fluctuations cannot be the result of rationally changing forecasts of future cash flows, he's suggesting that there may be an irrational component to these fluctuations. All right, so let's go to the second possible rational channel that might explain stock market fluctuations, changes in rationally forecasted future interest rates. So what's the story here? The story is this. The reason that prices might be high here, 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 and here is because at those moments, people were rationally forecasting lower interest rates in the next few years. And if interest rates are forecasted to be lower, that means that the competitor asset is less attractive, which might justify higher stock prices. And conversely, the reason prices were low here, 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 and here is because people at those moments rationally forecasted higher interest rates in the next few years, which would make the stock market less appealing, pushing down stock prices. Now, I should say this story is perfectly reasonable as a starting point, but it turns out that it cannot explain stock market fluctuations either. And the reason is an argument exactly analogous to the one that Schiller gave for the first channel. So what that means is if I do a graph like this where I have the price to earnings ratio on the horizontal and this time subsequent interest rates on the vertical, I should see a downward sloping line in the data. So you can just check. And do you get a downward sloping line? No. It's basically flat. Ruling out this channel as well as a possible driver of stock market fluctuation. All right, so we're running out of channels. Let's see, third channel, changes in rationally forecasted future risk. All right, so how does this story go? This story would say the reason prices are high here, here, and here is because at those moments, people were rationally forecasting lower risk in the next few years. Now, I should just say up front, this is a perfectly reasonable story initially, but it turns out that it cannot explain stock market fluctuations either. The reason? Again, a Schiller-type argument. So if the horizontal axis is the price to earnings ratio and the vertical axis is subsequent risk, for example, the volatility of the stock market, then under this story, we are predicting a downward sloping line. 
Why? Because under this story, the reason that the price earnings ratio is sometimes high is because people are forecasting less risk in the future. But if those forecasts are rational, then we should actually see lower risk on average in the future. And so we can go and check. I think you know what's going to happen. You actually get a flat line. So this is really quite striking, I think. Three of the four rational channels do not allow us to explain stock market fluctuations. They don't offer a way to understand stock market fluctuations. It's really quite striking and surprising. So there's only one rational channel left, changes in risk aversion. And this one, luckily, for the rational framework, I suppose, can, in principle, explain stock market fluctuations. I mean, the argument is really quite straightforward, which is the reason prices are high here, 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 and here is because at those moments, people are simply less risk averse. They're less scared of risk, and as a result, they're willing to pay more for the stock market. Conversely, the reason prices are low here, here, and here is because at those moments, people are more risk averse. They're more scared of risk, and so they're willing to pay less for the stock market. And a very obvious question that arises then is, why is risk aversion changing over time? And there is a standard answer to that question, which is this, that people don't want to give up the standard of living to which they have become accustomed. So sort of the idea is you've become accustomed to a certain standard of living, and then what happens is if the stock market goes down, you start getting worried that you might have to give up the standard of living to which you've become accustomed. You might have to move out of your house and move to a smaller house. So you become more risk averse, more scared, leading you to sell the stock market and causing a big downward fluctuation. Conversely, if the stock market goes up, then you feel wealthier. You're not so worried about having to give up your standard of living. You actually become less scared, less risk averse. As a result, you're actually willing to invest more in the stock market, pushing it even further up and causing a big upward fluctuation. And this idea broadly is called the habit formation hypothesis, particularly associated with some work of John Campbell and John Cochrane. And I think I can say it's probably the leading rational model of stock market fluctuations. So now, let's turn to the behavioral finance side. How would you explain stock market fluctuations from the behavioral finance perspective? There's a number of approaches, but I'm going to focus on the one that I think is the best known, which is one based on over-extrapolation of past returns. So what's the broad idea behind this approach? It's that some investors out there form beliefs about future stock market returns by extrapolating past returns. If the stock market has been rising over the past year or two, they expect it to keep rising. If the stock market has been falling over the past year or two, they expect it to keep falling. Understand that such beliefs are incorrect. If the stock market's been going up over the past year or two, it's actually more likely to perform poorly going forward than to perform well. And if the stock market's been performing poorly over the past year or two, it's actually more likely to perform well going forward than to keep performing poorly. But still, it's very plausible that some investors might have extrapolative beliefs of this kind. And what that means is people will think they can infer a lot from even a small sample of data. I guess the story is just, if the stock market has been going up for some time, then many people in the economy extrapolate that too far into the future. They now think that the stock market is going to keep performing well, so they buy the stock market aggressively, pushing it way up and causing a sharp upward fluctuation. <laughs> but now that the stock market is overvalued, eventually we would expect it to correct back down. So that's the over-extrapolation story for stock market volatility. And one of my more recent projects is a paper arguing that over-extrapolation is a good way of thinking about stock market fluctuation.